Hi everyone, Teddy Baldessar here. And in this video, we're gonna be answering some of your questions I asked on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. What are some of the questions you have for me? So today we're gonna to be answering them in this video. First question we have here asks, would you say 39 millimeters is the best size? So my overall view on this topic of what is the right case size for most people has really changed. I have talked about the subject a lot. And I noticed in the early days of this channel, I spoke mostly to my own point of view rather than speaking about what I think represents the larger scale of people out there and their preferences for wrist sizes uh, and watches that can fit on their wrists. If I had to pinpoint what is probably the sweet spot of size, I would say 40 millimeters is probably the best, but that is just an oversimplification, not factoring in lug to lug, thickness, how a watch weighs, the case material, the dial to bezel ratio, what type of watch is it? A dress watch versus a dive watch would create a totally different concept for your wrist. A dress watch versus a dive watch is going to create a completely different feel on the wrist, even if they have the same diameter. This has become probably one of my big pet peeves, and I'm not going to be picking on this person here by asking this question, because I think it's a fair question, but I think that very much what I've noticed with many collectors, including myself in the past, and even now sometimes, when I speak about what is an ideal size, I'm speaking about it from my point of view, rather than what I think is probably an accurate representation of the whole of people out there, which is that we have all different types of preferences when it comes to case sizes. So it's impossible to pinpoint what is the perfect size. I would also argue that for many watches, 39 millimeters, yes, might be a great sweet spot, but for other watches, it might not be a great sweet spot if you're trying to overlap with a wide variety of wrists. Just as an example on my wrist right now, I have a Speedmaster Moon Watch. This is 42 millimeters. If this watch was any smaller, I don't know if I would like it as much. I actually like it at 42 millimeters. It doesn't wear like a 42 millimeter watch, and I would think it's probably too small small if it was any smaller than that. But you look at this watch and you look at the measurements and you recognize how many features of it creates the broader idea of what this watch represents when you have it on the wrist. Yes, if you measure it from one side of the case to the other with that kind of asymmetrical look that you have here, 42 millimeters, but if you measure from bezel to bezel, it's 40 millimeters across. And a very compact lug to lug, the bracelet aids in its wear. So all of this to say that I do not think there is a perfect case size. And I think what I'm going to try to do going forward is really speak to a broader view on things. And this is something that I screwed up on. I've met with people in the past and they always give me a hard time for saying that I give a lot of preference to watches that fit smaller wrists. That's because I have a smaller wrist. So that's something I need to work on. I think also just as watch enthusiasts, it's, it's good to get out of your comfort zone. If you've never tried a specific case size and have always written it off in the past, I would highly encourage you to try something outside of your typical comfort zone. You might be surprised. I found myself wearing mostly 39 to 42 millimeter watches as of late, and that is a very big departure from where I was in the past, where I was wearing a lot of vintage watches from 33 millimeters to 36 millimeters being my sweet spot. So I've completely changed. And that only happened because I questioned what I thought was right for me. And I realized that it's way broader than I ever realized. So before we proceed to the next Q&A question, we have some new releases on teddybaldister.com that I wanna bring you up to speed on. First up is Seiko bringing back a legend, or at least bringing back a legendary colorway with the Pogue, reviving the legendary vintage chronograph now residing in the modern speed timer package. These have been flying and there's a lot of interest around these, so definitely get them while you can. Now, technically it is still summer and Oris released two new Aqua Summer Editions in a vibrant red and green with white ceramic bezels. In addition, we also just launched nearly a dozen new G-Shock styles on the site, including the DW6900 RCS-1, coming with some 90s retro looks, and then also a collection of colorful gradient dial G-Shocks, including the GA2100 TL-7A, with a white case in a dial that is pretty remarkable for a G-Shock, especially considering that they're just over $100. Check out all these and a lot more on teddybaldasar.com. These next batch of questions are asking a very similar thing. Here we have, Teddy, what do you think it will take for other brands to dethrone Rolex? Is it even possible? Simple answer is, I don't think it is going to be possible uh, in a very short window and probably not going to happen anytime in the future if I had to put a bet on it. Rolex has been able to dominate for basically over a half century, if not longer, and really solidifying themselves as a leader for luxury watches. And it's come down to branding. And I think that is actually a point that has been documented by some marketers and branders that Rolex is one of the most powerful brands in the world, top 50, regardless of industry, just because of the affiliation of the watches with the category, it being this aspirational brand. They've done such an amazing job in building a 
brand that transcends a category, and that very rarely happens. I've spoken about it many times in the past on the channel. Rolex is the guiding star for the rest of the industry. Not to say that they're the best brand in the world, that's not what I'm saying, but they dictate much of the success or the health of the industry based on what they're doing. They are pioneers for leading the charge in mass market awareness. And if they are doing specific things, usually that is an indicator of where the rest of the industry is probably going to go after the fact. And even if you look at the numbers, so looking at the Morgan Stanley and Lux Consult report, this is something I look at all the time. This is 2023 data. Just to give a sense of turnover, Rolex in 2023 had 10.1 billion Swiss francs in turnover. That is the highest figure they've ever been able to achieve in their history, and that's happening in 2023, 2024. And why I'm saying it's a long shot, another brand would overtake Rolex, it comes down to looking at the number two and number three positions. So you have Cartier and Omega. And with those two brands, if you look at the turnover numbers in 2023, Cartier comes in with 3.1 billion. That is just watch sales, by the way. It's a little bit different when we're talking about jewelry overall. And then Omega came in with 2.6 billion. Both of these are ridiculous numbers to say the least but it just gives a sense to Rolex. If Rolex independently as a brand was seen as a group like Richemont and the Swatch Group, if you don't include Tudor, just Rolex, that would be the largest of any Swiss watch organization and one of the largest luxury groups in the world for that matter. And another thing I would mention too is if Rolex is going to be struggling to a degree where another brand could try to overtake them, that probably also means that there isn't going to be another brand to overtake them because if Rolex is struggling, it's also, again, that leading indicator for the industry that the industry is struggling. And I would imagine other brands would also be feeling it the same way Rolex was. Next question asks, does higher frequency mean higher accuracy? So it absolutely can mean that. And if you think about frequency and how that can relate to accuracy, you're thinking about distributions of energy and how frequently they are happening in a five hertz movement, let's just say that as an example, traditionally being called a high beat caliber, you have more transfers of energy per second that are happening in a movement of that frequency compared to other frequencies like three hertz and four hertz. With more stability can create more possibility for accuracy, but stability is the key word here when you're talking about high frequency movements. So just think about this, in a four hertz movement, you have eight beats per second. So that is one swing of the balance in one direction, that's gonna happen eight times per second in a four hertz movement. In a three hertz movement, you have six beats per second. And then in a five hertz movement, you have 10 beats per second. Another way you can think about it as well, would you prefer to have smaller chunks of energy being received externally more times per second or less times per second? Another great analogy that I heard when thinking about frequency and thinking about what is the benefit of a higher frequency caliber, there are downsides and we can talk about those, but it was the analogy of spinning a top and the tightness of that rotation that top spinning on a table, if the rotation is going to be tighter and somebody was going to bang on that table with their fist, what is more likely to happen and throw off that spin? If it's moving quicker or if it's moving slower? The answer is if it's rotating quicker, that is going to be more beneficial to not being interrupted by that shock. And the same can be said for the oscillation of balance, going to be less susceptible to shocks. Also, when it comes to measuring different forms of time, another reason why brands use higher frequency movements, say something like the El Primero, it can also measure smaller intervals and more precise points of time. There are some downsides though to high frequency. Efficiency is obviously going to be a tough thing to manage. And then friction, there are gonna be more points of friction per second than you would in a lower frequency movement. Next question asks, is your boutique business taking time away from your YouTube fans? So I, it's weird to say fans. I don't really consider you guys fans. I mean, as I like to say when I meet somebody and really how I like to classify myself is I'm just a guy. I just like watches and now I'm able to get in front of the camera and talk about them daily. So that's how I see myself. In terms of taking away from YouTube, that has not happened. If anything, it's allowed me to have more support when being able to hire more people and assist what we're doing, that is for sure. But it's also been able to establish more dynamic ways to connect with all of you. Uh, some of you may have been able to attend our Grand Seiko event a few weeks back, or probably at the time of recording this video, several weeks back. We had 400 people show up, 80% of you came from out of state. And being able to shake your hands, spend some time with you all, uh, really get lost in some watchmaking. We had a Japanese watch maker come all the way over from Studio Shizuku Ishii to do live assembly of the 9S A4. Phenomenal day, some great drink, great food. Uh, we had a Japanese calligrapher there, a sushi bar, and then a lot of good fun and being able to meet people for the first time. And that was 
Very surreal moment for me to be able to interact with people on that level. This would not have been possible if I did not have this type of extension of a store environment and a physical location that I could call my own. And this is something that I'd love to do more in the future, but it's another aspect of why I love doing this. Uh, being in front of the camera is amazing, but one thing I love even more is being able to shake somebody's hand and just see that all these digital interactions turn into something that's tangible and real in the flesh with people and be able to see the joy that comes to somebody's uh, in a face when they're able to handle a watch in person. It's just a very different idea that I was not familiar with, and that was the first time I was able to do that. So if you want to partake in events like that in the future, I'll, I'll leave a link down below to an event signup page, but that's something I definitely want to do more of. And that's been the added benefit of going in this direction. The next question asks, the nearsighted, oh, I'm right there with you, buddy. How to deal with buyer's remorse? So buyer's remorse is something I think about actually quite a bit. And I am always very thoughtful when trying to make a decision because of past mistakes I've made. But those mistakes were the very reason why I'm able to now go forward and not make mistakes as frequently. I always say that you should take your time with the purchase, really think about it. But the truth is, if you don't make a mistake in your collecting journey, you probably are not collecting. You are just sitting on the sidelines because it's inevitable. You're going to make a purchase that is not going to be right for you. That is part of the journey and it makes you a better collector because of it. So the first point is accept that idea as being potentially inevitable. Experience through a mistake is more valuable than arriving at the right decision by accident. If you make that right decision by accident, that is not going to teach you anything. It's the mistakes that are going to allow you to grow. This also goes without being said, but learn from the mistake. Do not do it again. If you just speak to yourself, okay, this is what I've learned from making this purchase. Here are the things that I did not like about this watch that I thought were going to be great and I thought it was going to be an excellent fit for me. If you can take a step back and recognize what those things are, it's going to ensure that you are going to learn from them in the future. Don't just simply say, this doesn't work for me. Actually think about why this watch doesn't work for you and use that in your decision-making process as you go forward. Another thing that I like to do, if there's ever a watch that I fall out of love with, and this is really just for any things in my life, or if I maybe have extended further up my collecting journey in some other areas, and this is with watches or anywhere else. I'm into other things like fragrances, uh, Goodyear welted boots, things of this sort. So whenever I have maybe too many of something, I use a mistake or something that I've grown out of as an opportunity to bring joy to somebody else. This is the most rewarding way to make a mistake not hurt at all. If you could take something that you own, maybe you don't love it as much, but can give it to somebody else for them to love it, that makes that mistake feel a whole lot different and it becomes a pathway of joy for somebody else to feel. So I highly recommend this. If you can part with it, I, I really would do it. It, it would do, totally change your feeling about that purchase where you're not gonna be beating yourself up. Instead, you're gonna be feeling good about it. Just learn for the future. And maybe you can't do this and hand it off to somebody. Maybe sell it and then use that for a future purchase. And maybe if it's not giving something away, it's giving it away to somebody that maybe is very interested in it. If say it's a luxury watch, you're not gonna wanna just give it away. Maybe give it to somebody that you know is looking for a watch like that, but give it to them at a fair, reasonable price where you know it's going to a good home and you could feel even better about making that mistake, which you know, weird to say out loud, but I think it's good to learn from these things and move on accordingly and don't beat yourself up. Next question comes from Victor. He asks, do you wear a watch at home or is it purely an outdoor item? Now I wear watches basically all the time, apart from three times in my life, I do not wear them. One is gonna be when I am sleeping, I find them to be not as comfortable as a side sleeper since I am a side sleeper. Uh, it's not usually something that I will typically do. I have worn a watch to bed before, but it's not something I volunteer doing quite frequently. The other time I don't wear a watch is when I'm working out. Sometimes I might wear like a Casio or a G-Shock but very rarely do I do that. So that's another time I don't do it. And the third instance where I'm not wearing a watch is when I am in the water. It could be shower, could be in the pool, anything of that sort. Typically, I'm not going to wear it as well, but in all other circumstances, even if I'm sitting on the couch at home, sitting at my desk and I'm working, I am wearing a watch. It's very important for me to wear a watch all the time just because it allows me to be better at my job, which is to try out as many watches as possible and feel comfortable with wearing them. And it allows me to get a better sense of how all of you would wear them and knowing that day to day so that I can give a better representation of what to expect when you look to maybe buy a watch. Next question asks, how often does a stranger approach you about your watch and how often do these people recognize you as Teddy? So 
I am very rarely going to be approached about the watch that I am wearing. This was before I even had a YouTube channel talking about watches on a day-to-day -day basis. People, generally speaking, do not show interest in the watch that you're wearing. It's also a very small detailed object that you're wearing and you have to get pretty up close and personal to be able to see exactly what it is unless you have an eagle eye and you're very into this game of watch collecting. That's why I always stress that you should buy a watch because you love it, not because other people are going to see it and be impressed by it because chances are they're not gonna see it and the people that are going to see it might not even know what the hell they're looking at. But then your other point, that is usually what happens more often. I think people will approach me just recognizing maybe the channel, which is a surreal thing. I always love when people approach me, whether it's at the airport, out in public, like never feel discouraged to come up to me. I always love meeting somebody that watches the channel, but that usually is something that happens before they're looking at my watch, probably because I have this goofy look with my glasses and everything, and I, maybe I have a distinct look, and it's a little bit easier to recognize this big noggin than it is a small watch on my wrist. So that's probably why uh, I have the latter of those two happen more frequently. Next question is, when is Nico coming on the channel? Should we have Nico on the channel? Should we do something? And we've been talking about this for a while. If you wanna see that, leave a comment down below, and maybe we can make something happen. We'd love to see some encouragement if you guys wanna see that. Next question asked, this is not even a watch question, but I've always wondered where Teddy gets his button down collars. He's asking this question as if I'm not gonna read this. The fit is always perfect. Well, I appreciate that. I don't think that's always the case. The fashion police do come for me sometimes, uh, but I always liked men's style. And that was something that, if you remember the early stage of this channel, some of the first videos I ever posted on this channel were also around other topics like men's style and things of that sort. Uh, so this wasn't always just a watch channel. I have a variety of interests, but watches were the first thing that I posted and something that is very, I'm very passionate about and a huge element of my day to day and what I care about. So that's why this channel is what it is. But to answer your question, I'm assuming that you're talking about the Oxford cloth button downs that I typically wear. So traditional Oxford cloth button downs I will usually go to Brooks Brothers, Taylor Stitch. Uh, those are probably some of the go-tos. I also have uh, some Oxford cloth button downs from Drake's. Those are a little bit more expensive, so I don't have as many of those. Uh, Gitman Brothers, also a really good place to look. L.L. Bean even has some reasonable ones at solid prices that I think have good construction. Corridor New York City is another place that I would recommend. But then once you start to get into the linen category as well, like something like today, this is this is from Brooks Brothers. Uh, Alex Crane has a lot of great options, uh, giving you basically my entire wardrobe here, most, most of them. So uh, that is some places I'd recommend. There's many others, but those are some on the short list. But all right, guys, that is the Q&A for today. If you enjoy these style of videos, let me know. Give me a thumbs up. Really do appreciate that. Be sure to subscribe as well and follow along on different social media accounts so you can take part in these Q&As in the future. We like doing these every other month or so. Also, definitely check out teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. And how we're able to fund all of our productions here is through selling watches. So if you are in the market for a watch, we'd love to have your business. Allows us to keep doing what we're doing here. We love what we do. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well. And I'll see you all very soon.